checking one, two. Is that is that good? Is that loud enough? Maybe a little bit more. And the live stream's loud enough, I guess. <clears throat> you are on, so you're live, so whatever you're talking. What? You're on, so be careful. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, let's begin. All right. Let's gather. That's good. I hate to break in on your fellowship. <laughs> the fellowship may be as important as what I got to say. Yes, hallelujah. Everybody doing good? Got a good group? Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to pray in just a second. Uh, what uh, is it that causes revelation to appeal to you or attracts you? attracts you to revelation. Uh, do you have any thoughts about what it is that compels you or draws you to study and read th this book? I want to know what's going on. Okay. Okay, that's good. You want to know what's going on, what's coming. Okay, that's good. Curiosity, information. Anybody else? Darlene? Very good. <clears throat> I want to welcome all the live streamers tonight. And if you have a question, I have my phone on for my text, so text it, any comment or question. We'd like for you to participate as well and appreciate uh, you joining us through the live stream. Anybody else? Yes, Wade. That's good. You're, you're interested in prophecy in general, so Revelation would be a part of that. Anybody else? Dar uh, Joan? Okay. <clears throat> Very good. Very good. I like uh, I like seeing Jesus pictured uh, offensive. You know, instead of being mocked and beat up. Right. Projected. That's really good. That's really good because we talked about how Revelation is a if it is a, like a pictorial album. <clears throat> And the portrayal or picture of Jesus in Revelation is totally different than anywhere else. So you're actually, when you go to Revelation, you're not duplicating anything. You now you'll come across truths and themes that that have been uh, introduced previously, especially in Daniel and uh, with the uh, words of and teachings of Jesus about prophecy in Matthew 24, but. <clears throat> The portrayal of Jesus in Revelation is a is an exalted uh, kingship um, fulfillment of the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. So to get, and I talked about that before, 
to get what we might call a well-rounded uh, understanding of Jesus and to know him according to what he really is and not just a piece of the portrayal like in the Gospels, which is that's wonderful too. But Revelation really adds something to your knowledge of Jesus and therefore your relationship to Jesus that's not accomplished through any other book of the Bible. Revelation sticks out as being so unusual, so different. It's actually in a category by itself. If you'll remember when we studied kind of like New Testament survey and we categorized the Old Testament books and the New Testament books. I think we did that last year sometime. Um, in the New Testament, in, in the category of prophecy, it's the only book. It, so it's the only book in that category. Whereas in the Old Testament, you would have several in the category of prophecy, major prophets, minor prophets. Go to the New Testament, well, prophets, uh, prophecy. Now, it's not that we don't have prophecy in the Gospels, we do, but we're talking about a book dedicated to just that subject. And Revelation uh, is, is alone in that. And um, it's the last book of the Bible. And we <clears throat> studied, like in the introduction of Revelation, we have the thesis that this is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And this is the maybe the part of the com complexity of Revelation is it claims something that's not obviously true. Revelation claims something that I would say most Christians, if you didn't show it to them, they wouldn't know it. Uh, or, or maybe wouldn't remember it. And, and would not perceive Revelation in that way. Um, that, for example, Revelation has a, a devotional aspect to it. Um, Revelation is typically seen as something very difficult and very mysterious, and that causes some people to shy away from it. But, like some of you mentioned, it's the very thing that attracts other people to it, because even though it may be mysterious and difficult and there's truths underneath the service that you have to dig for or whatever, some people like that. They, they like the mystery and they like the... Um, the complexities and the depths of prophecy and revelation. So it, that would attract some people, but <clears throat> it repels other people. So, but but uh, revelation, the book, promises a blessing to those that will read it and hear it and keep it. So it claims that, but the reputation, the general reputation of, of revelation, does not. Uh, include that to a large extent. So that is one of the values that I that I see in having a class where we study and discuss, and I I have the opportunity to share with you what I've studied and learned over the years, because uh, and, and that objective that I have is to 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 help people get over the hump where they're attracted to it, they want to do it. There, there's no fear of it anymore. And for us all to practice digging, to discover things that the casual look will overlook. The, the casual look of Revelation will miss the very purpose of the book itself. It, which is, so it's, again, Revelation kind of stands out as a, um, in a category all by itself. We're not used to it. Um, even the Old Testament, but like Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet. The whole book is, is considered prophecy. Even though it has some history in it, it's primarily a book of prophecy. Uh, but it reads differently. It's to, it's, the layout is totally different. Uh, the only thing in the Old Testament that's comparable to Revelation is the book of Daniel. And fortunately, it's a lot shorter and you can you you can get into it, and it's not as in depth as Revelation, but it's the prep book to get you ready for Revelation. Um, ideally, if you were going to take a course, 
in Revelation. We were say going to teach it verse by verse like we did before. We would, we would want to at least have a summary look at Daniel first. Because Revelation presupposes previous re, uh, revelations with a small r. <clears throat> the book of Revelation with a capital R presupposes that you're acquainted with Revelation with a small r. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that you've read the, New, the Old Testament, you're familiar with Daniel. Even when you get to Jesus and his teaching on prophecy, Matthew 24, he said, um, he, he makes reference to Daniel standing in the holy place, or the Antichrist, talking about the Antichrist, the abomination that maketh desolation, which is from Daniel chapter 9. And, and in parentheses, Jesus says, whosoever readeth, let him understand. When he mentions Daniel, Whos, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Talking about Daniel. So again, to understand some of what Jesus was saying in Matthew 24, he refers you back to pre previous prophecies of the old. There's a reason, and it's a very practical reason, why God chose to wait and put Revelation on the very tail end of his holy book. Um, I'm glad he didn't put Revelation first, you know, like in the 40s and 50s, like the, the Gospels begin to come out in the 40s and 50s A.D. And Revelation was the last, like 99 A.D. or 100 A.D., at the very end. When Revelation was written, all the apostles were dead. Paul's dead. Paul had been dead for probably 25 or 30 years. And John's out there all by himself. He's the last one. And he's exiled, and, and he's old, and uh, he's you know, banished to die on this remote island. <clears throat> and John has his finest moments at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry. And, well, when you look at the subject matter of Revelation, it's appropriate that that book would be the last one. Now, it wouldn't be the first. It shouldn't be the middle one. It shouldn't be uh, whatever, except exactly the where it's at. Um, because everything that is in front of Revelation gets you ready for Revelation. And Revelation is the climax of the ministry of Jesus. It's called the testimony of Jesus. But like Jeremy talked about, with the, to see Jesus in a, an aggressive, um, offensive, as conqueror and king and coming Messiah and riding on a horse and raising the dead, <laughs> establishing the kingdom, sitting on a throne. Uh, that's been prophesied before, but in Revelation we see how, how it's going to be fulfilled. And the prophecies of Jesus Messiah is reiterated but with a lot of details. Yes, Brother Steve. Well, in the very introduction, it's, it addresses, that's a good question, uh, he does address to John that these words are to be sent to the churches. So there is an audience in the, in the introduction. And it is assumed, and this is where some people would disagree with what I'm going to say, but I believe it's true. Some people believe that that introduction of, of, of send this to the seven churches is like just the introduction part and chapter 2 and chapter 3 because there are specific messages to specific churches that he addresses in the inter introduction. The, the churches are listed in chapter 1 and then in chapter 2 individual churches get individual messages. Well then when you leave chapter 4 some people put a demarcation line there and say okay now we're like um, leaving the church. And, um, and, and of course, there are those who believe that there's a there's a, a resurrection that Revelation doesn't talk about. There's a mystery revelation, and so that gets into how some people interpret Revelation as being non-relevant to the church. But um, 
the, the Lord instructed John in verse 19 of chapter 1, Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, which starts in chapter 4. So, write the things that were, the things that are, 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 are present, and the things that shall be hereafter. Um, write these things down. And then he immediately mentions the churches. So I would say the Revelation does have an audience. It's specified in chapter 1, uh, enumerated and itemized in chapter 2 and 3. And then it continues on to write where John is writing what Jesus told him to, and that is the things that shall be hereafter. And those were to be sent to the churches as well. So, but there are, there are, and it's a big segment of the evangelical church that believe that revelation basically is not relevant to the church because we're going to be gone. Uh, we'll be caught up to heaven. There's secret catch uh, escape that's going to happen at any moment. And so revelation, everybody agrees revelation is primarily about the tribulation period climaxing at the second coming. But if you believe that there is this secret um, escape for the church so that it doesn't go through the tribulation, then from chapter 4 on to the end of the book, it's just to satisfy your curiosity. It really doesn't have a practical uh, benefit to you, but I don't believe that at all because it plainly states in the thesis, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear and keep the words of this prophecy. He's talking about the whole book. Keep it. Keep it. Well, when you go into the book, you see several areas where God's people are called saints. They're called the elect. You call the church here at the beginning. Um, the elect. I said that. Um, there are overcomers. There are people who keep the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, to me, that's us. You know. And then in chapter 20, there is a resurrection. There is a rapture in chapter 20. After the tribulation is over, there is a rapture, and it says in chapter 20, this is the first one. So I can't believe that there has been a previous one if that's the first one, and that's post-trib in chapter 20, right at the end of the book. So there are a lot of reasons why I don't go with this thing of revelation as not being practical. But that's, that's part of the reason why a lot of Bible believers evangelicals, fundamentalists, whatever you want to call them, spirit-filled even, uh, don't study Revelation. What they want to do is buy a book, and there's a bunch of them coming out now um, about the end times because so much is happening. I mean, I see on Facebook, uh, Dr. Jeffries in Texas, he's coming out with one, and uh, another guy coming out with the, uh, something about the escape or the disappearance. It's a book just came out, and then... Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of uh, commentary being produced about the end times. And, and a lot of it, I haven't read them, but <clears throat> I assume because of the people that I respect that there, it's good stuff, good, a lot of good stuff. But the problem that I have is in the midst of a lot of that, there is this um, assumption that revelation is not that necessary to, for Christians to study. And so if you take one of these books, they'll just tell you basically a summary of what's going to happen. Now, it doesn't apply to you because you know, you're going to be caught up. And you won't even be here. So it's, it doesn't really have a practical implication for you. But it's the Bible, and they, have, they can't neglect it. So you know, there's um, people who believe that we're not going to be here and that this is not relevant still are going to study it and teach on it and write books about it. And a lot of, and this is something that bothers me a lot because I don't think it's right. Um, and I just saw it again today. <clears throat> but there's a lot of people who have really strong opinions and even teach it and are leaders um, that... Um, 
that simply have not studied it. They've just not studied it. And their knowledge has been derived from what somebody said that somebody said that somebody said that somebody said was in the book of Revelation or in the Bible. And there's a lot of hand-me-down theology, a lot of hand-me-down ideas and opinions. And, um, and, and God's people, Bible believers, are helpful, and they want to help other people, and they're very sincere, and so they want to share what they believe. But a lot of what's being shared about prophecy and end time is, is not based on foren- what I call forensic, forensic examination of the evidence. It's like a crime. <clears throat> like a murder something like. so they have to come in and investigate so you're going to call the witnesses are there any witnesses uh, what's the crime scene look like uh, how many bullet holes you know um, any fingerprints I mean you, that's for forensics and that's the first step of dis- deciding the truth about this mystery is forensics that's number one um and looking at the blood, looking at the, the body, uh, who was there, and asking questions of any witnesses. And then, beyond that, it's interesting to ask the neighbors, have you, you know, Sue that was murdered, um, the prime suspect is her husband, Bill. <laughs> so uh, what did you notice about Bill? Oh, Bill couldn't have killed his wife. It's impossible. Uh, he just gave her flowers last week. That's interesting information, but it doesn't establish the facts of the case. It never will. Interesting, and they, they want to write that down because it might corroborate something. It might, it might help with a motive. But all the time when, when a punk goes into a convenience store and blows people away, and then he gets killed in the process of ki- committing the crime, they talk to to Aunt uh, Susie, oh, he was just getting his life together. He was a good boy. He wouldn't, you know, it's like, well, we, it's on the video. We, he, we know he did it. Oh, and, uh, he just wouldn't do that. He's a sweet boy. Well, you don't go with the, the, the commentary or the fiction, even though it's sincere, to determine who is guilty. Who killed Sue? Did her husband do it or not? Forensics, number one. And I see that in prophecy, there's not a lot of forensics in certain areas. There, it may be partially forensic, and I'm talking about uh, studying the scriptures and doing the cross-references and letting the Bible speak for itself, letting the Bible interpret itself. Let the Bible be the witness for itself, primarily. And then, yes, uh, you can go... if. If you want to, if you want to read a series of fictional books about the rapture, go ahead. But that best not be the primary source of your knowledge, and that is unfortunately the way it is with a lot of Christians. They know what they know, or they know what they think they know, and some of it I think is true. Um, but it's not, it's not the Bible way of knowledge and doctrine and theology is to depend of all things on fiction to deliver the truth. And, and that is becoming more and more a common way of dealing with prophecy, is create a fiction story. And then in the fictional story, slip in what you think the Bible teaches. It's very interesting, but it's probably more interesting. It, it flows better than the Bible itself. It, it could be because they, you know, but it's fiction. It's novels. Tim LaHaye, Left Behind, all that series. Do you know how many millions of people were affected by that series of, of fictional books on the end times? Um, and it's supposed to be based on the Bible, and, and I, I believe it is. But there are there are principles involved that are that's not good that's not good because you don't want just secondary sources as the foundation of what you know man shall live 
by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So commentaries are, are good, but it's like salt and pepper. You use them like salt and pepper. Uh, it's like, a, I, wonder, I wonder what Dr. Jeffries thinks about the book of Revelation. Uh, so it'll yeah, be interesting because we love him and we respect him, so we want to know what he thinks. That's fine. Wonderful. It might help you. It might confirm something or it may be a red flag. You say, well, you know, I, I just disagree with uh, Dr. Jeff, uh, Jeffers. Is it Jeffries or Jeffers? I like him. But uh, Tim LaHaye, John Hagee, and all these guys that are prophetic hobbyists um, have some really really good contributions but it should not be um, a fictional based education system for people who won't read it themselves and if you could guarantee that people are studying Revelation on their own and treating Revelation just like any other book of the New Testament don't discriminate against Revelation if you're doing that then maybe John Hagee and LaHaye and Hal Lindsey and some of these guys maybe they won't hurt you but I believe it's a damage to the body of Christ for there to be so much opinionated information that, in my opinion, some of it is just not true. It's just not true. This rap, the secret rapture or resurrection that could happen at any second renders the ministry or the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, Mark 13, it renders it null and void and like revelation. It's not for us. It's not for us. It's not for us because Jesus said immediately after the tribulation he would gather his to, he would gather together his elect. It kind of settles it for me. But so you have to take what Jesus says and well he wasn't talking to us. The book of Revelation. There's only two resurrections according to Jesus. Only two resurrections, and the first one is in Revelation chapter 20. And these popular guys are teaching that it happened before you even get to Revelation. It's already happened. It's past. We're in heaven. And if you're in Revelation, it's because you're, you're not a Christian. Um, Book of Revelation would be a, kind of a guide for uh, prodigals and backsliders and sinners and wicked people that miss the rapture. So maybe if you'll take the book of Revelation after the church is already gone and you've been left behind, maybe you might could be saved, maybe. It'd be, maybe, you know, you could be it, it'd be, it would be practical for the sinner. And it's totally opposite of what the Bible says. So it bothers me that that's such a major theme in the, in the Bible-believing churches today. People believe it. And when you begin to dig, where did you get that? Where did you get that? I've never known anybody that said, I started believing in the secret escape of the church <clears throat> because of reading my Bible. I've never, and I'm, of course, I hadn't talked to everybody either, so I'm not saying it's not a scientific poll, but <clears throat> I don't know of anybody that came to believe that revelation is not for us and that we're going to be off the planet when revelation begins to be fulfilled. I've never known anybody to come to that conclusion because of reading the Bible. It's always a fiction book. Or it's always a Hal Lindsey, which Hal Lindsey's great, late great planet Earth was not fiction. Um, it just seems like now that's the trend. Is, is Let's teach prophecy by telling a story uh, that's all made up and put the... Put the the doctrine inside it so anyway uh, revelation must be looked at just like you'd look at Matthew and anything that says or implies that what Jesus taught his disciples is not for you to me that's a serious blunder that's a serious blunder because the same here's the thing in Matthew 24 when he says immediately after the tribulation which agrees with revelation chapter 20 that says this is the first and Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation will you see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, and he will send forth his angel and gather together his elect from the four winds. Trumpet, clouds, just like Paul in 1 Corinthians 5. But to relegate the words of Jesus and say, well, he was talking to lost Israel. 
that the disciples in 24 represent the lost, the, the lost nation of Israel that didn't receive Jesus. And so the tribulation would be pertinent to them because they're going to miss the rapture. That's the logic. And, um, but in Matthew 24, when he says that the gathering of the people of God, he's talking to disciples, which the Bible says are the pillars of the church. When he says to the disciples immediately after the tribulation, four chapters later, it's the same group, and he gives them the Great Commission. Uh, and there's nobody in the whole cotton-picking world that would say that when Jesus is talking to his disciples in Matthew 28, he's talking to the lost Israel. Everybody agrees. When he's talking to the disciples and he gives them the Great Commission, that's us. Yeah. You know, uh, we got to win souls. Wow. Are we required to win souls? Are we required to witness? Yes. By what authority? Matthew 28. Okay, well, look at that. Well, he's gathered with his disciples. He speaks to them and gives them a great commission. Matthew 24, four chapters over. It's the same thing. And he tells them. They ask, when are you coming? When's the end of the world? He says, well, here are the signs. And he gives a sign. And he says, then after that, you'll see me coming. You'll see me. He says, you'll see the abomination of desolation. So to me, the simple thing, the forensic approach of who killed Sue is look at the crime scene, look at the evidence, and just use your head. What, what does it say? Now, Aunt Mary across the street said, no, nah, he wouldn't do that. And ironically, a lot of people believe that the church will not go through the tribulation. And their basis and of their authority of that, I just don't think God did do that. <laughs> it's the same thing as Aunt Mary said, no, Bill wouldn't do that. Well, Bill's got blood all over his hands. What, what, are we to do, deny that and go with Aunt Mary over there because she likes Bill? Bill gave her flowers. Bill's got blood on his hand. He's got his footprints there. You have to divorce your emotions whether you want to go through the tribulation or not, it doesn't, that doesn't mean nothing. It doesn't mean what you, what you want, what you prefer. I just don't think. No, what saith the Scriptures? That's where we go. What saith the Scriptures? And so if we look at that, we come up with different conclusions on some things. Something. And that's the big deal to me. The big deal is this teaching that, um, that at any second, in a twinkling of an eye, the church could disappear from the planet. And then the Antichrist comes on, and then we have revelation. But even Paul said, I, I beseech you, brother, by the coming of the Lord and by our gathering together unto him, that that day shall not take place except there come a falling away and the man of sin be revealed. That's forensics. Yeah, but I, no, there's no but. He, he, he just gave you the answer right there. And Jesus gave you the answer. And the revelation gave you the answer. There's a resurrection, which is the rapture, in chapter 20 of Revelation. And it says, this is the first one. Can, there cannot have been one before it. And Paul says the rapture is going to take place at the last trumpet. Okay? Everybody, believes, everybody agrees that. Um, last trumpet. Last trumpet. <clears throat> so, if the resurrection takes place before the tribulation, like they say, like the fiction books say, and I go to Revelation and there's seven more. Forensic examination says this is a Sherlock Holmes type of thing. It's just like Sherlock Holmes thinking. If there are seven trumpets during the period in question, the last cannot be before number one. That's a mathematical statement of common sense, and Sherlock Holmes would solve the case based on that type of logic. And the last trumpet, 
And that's non-negotiable. Every, pre-trivers, everybody. Last trumpet, yep, yep, yep. And I said, well, there's seven more after that, so how do you explain that? Well, it's uh, seven of a different category. At the last trump. Why do you say last trump? Okay. All right. That's, okay, I'll give you that one. Okay. But, all right, the last trump. Okay, where are the trumpets that went before that? And I've never read any where they would talk about any other trumpets before the rapture if, in a pre-trib rapture scenario. Where are the... If it's the last trump, then doesn't that mean that there were trumpets before that? And it's never talked about. It's missing. They just said last trump. So you got two problems. One, you got seven after the last, which means it's not last. Throw it away. That theory won't work. And then another problem is that if it's the last trump, you have to have previous trumpets. So if you accept the book of Revelation, that it is for the church, it gives you, and we'll, we're going to study these seven trumpets. And sure enough, at the last one, it takes place. So it, it fits. It, there's no, there's no, there's no forcing a, a square peg in a round hole. We don't have to do that. It's nice and tidy, nice and tidy. Everybody's agree. You got, you got uh, uh, Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah and the minor prophets. You got Jesus coming along. You have Paul, the Rapture man. Everybody loves uh, uh, Paul. And then you have the John with the Book of Revelation. If you accept Revelation as practical and for the church, it puts all of the proponents of prophecy or the teachers, writers of prophecy, it makes them all on the same page. You don't have to pick ones that, well, we don't, we don't accept his. Think about how it is that people could say, don't listen to Jesus on that subject. Now, you listen to them everything else, but... So to me, these teachers or proponents of that have an agenda. They already know what they believe. Then they go to the Bible after the fact and try to, try to make it fit. And they have to contort and twist, and it just doesn't fit. You've you got to change definitions. For example, Jesus says, coming, after the, uh, immediately after the tribulation shall this, shall you see the son of man coming and that word coming parousia Paul comes along and talks about the rapture which everybody accepts and he says at the coming 1 Corinthians 15 at the and it's the same word coming so uh, forensically logically as Sherlock Holmes would look at it when is the coming Matthew 24 Immediately after the tribulation. When is the resurrection? At the coming. So, logic deduction says, if the coming is after the tribulation and the resurrection is at the coming, therefore, resurrection is after the tribulation. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. You see the logic of that? I mean, the, it's tight. It's solid. And so... When we come to Revelation, we can't discriminate against it. When we come to the words of Jesus and he's talking to 12 apostles, we're everywhere else in the Bible. He says, "Upon he, this is the church. This is the, the leaders of the church, the future church. And before Matthew 24, he had already said and taught the disciples in Matthew 17 and 18, he had already said, upon this rock I will build my church. He had already said to these people, Rejoice in that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. These apostles do not represent an unsaved Israel that's going to miss the rapture and be under the wrath of God. It's, the apostles had eternal life. He had already uh, talked to them about binding and loosing on earth, be bound in heaven, loosed in uh, heaven. Uh, rock, I'll build my church. I give you authority. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father. Uh, 
He said, you have eternal life. They had already preached the gospel. They had already cast out devils. They came back and said, the devils are subject to us. And then they meet, and he says, immediately after tribulation, you're going to see me coming back. And then Paul says the rapture is going to take place at the coming. How, how is, are these fiction books credible? Or any of these pre-trib teaching, how can it be credible when it doesn't fit the examination in a forensic way of the evidence? It doesn't matter what Mary said. Bill killed his wife. I'll tell you that. She, he killed her. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think, I think John, in John, it says that that day should not overtake you as a thief. Is that John? That's Paul. See, that's, and that's good because Paul, Paul is the one that gives us the details of we which are alive and remain in the coming shall be caught up together. and gives the, the, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, and Paul taught the Thessalonians that to those who are not looking for him, he will come as a thief. But Paul said, I would not have you to, you to be ignorant, talking to the church, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So you're right. A Thief in the Night, which was a very famous book, prophecy, Thief in the Night, um, the great late planet Earth, was based upon the, the, the common popular doctrine called eminence. It's called eminence. And that is the resurrection is eminent. And that there are no preliminary preliminary signs according to their doctrine. There's no preliminary signs. That's why you, you have to discount what Jesus said because the whole chapter 24 and 25 have to do with preliminary signs before he comes. So if you divorce the resurrection from the coming of Christ, um, then uh, you, don't, you don't have to consider what Jesus said. So if he says it, well, uh, but the rapture's not... I read it today. Again, somebody on Facebook was correcting somebody. He said, oh, no, no, no. You have to understand the rapture, the resurrection, and the second coming of Christ are two separate events. And... Um, well, that's, that's, that's Aunt Mary talking back there. That's the same kind of thing. Arbitrarily separated. That's not what it says. So the thief in the night, everybody's heard about thief in the night, thief in the night. So forensically, look at what, 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 you know, what is said there in the context or whatever. He is not talking to the church about the thief in the night. Uh, when, Je when the disciples ask Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming? And Paul says the resurrection is at the coming. That means the signs are, are, are for us. He's not wasting his breath on Israel. He's talking to us. He's talking to the disciples. He's not talking about the, to the Pharisees. Now, if he said that to the Pharisees, I, 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 could, I could give more credence to that. I still wouldn't believe it, but it would be more logical because Pharisees represent unbelieving Israel. He's talking, about, he's talking to apostles that had already he, uh, preached and healed the sick. And, and he had already said, your names were written in the Lamb's of Goliath. Uh, they, they never represent Israel. They never do. Pharisees maybe, but not the apostles. So um, the eminence says, the teaching of eminence is it could happen any time. Well, Jesus said it can't happen any time. It says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, when you see it, that's a sign. When the, when the sun is darkened, which we'll, we'll study that, when the sun is darkened and the moon turns to blood, that's after the tribulation and before the day of the Lord, based on Joel 2 and Acts 2 and Matthew 24. Three references that show us that when the sun dark is darkened and the moon turns to blood, that's after the tribulation and before the day of the Lord. In other words, that's the last celestial sign that lets you know tribulation is over and the kingdom of God is coming. And that means Armageddon, that means Jesus coming and raising the dead, like Paul said. 
And Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 15 says, at his coming. Read today, somebody said, oh, no, not at his coming. Those are two separate things. Well, if you, if you do that, that's arbitrary with no evidence. It's just contrary to common sense, contrary to evidence, contrary to the Bible, contrary to what they said. And then what, like I said, what is unthinkable to me is to say, I don't have to listen to Christ. When he's on that subject, no, because I believe there's no signs. Jesus said, here are the signs, and you'll see them, and hear what they are. Who's the audience? Boy, that's important. Who's the audience? Twelve apostles. Who are they? The pillars, foundation of the church. And then, in the famous chapter 15, which is the resurrection chapter of Paul's, he said, Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. And if Christ is raised, we also shall be raised. Talking about resurrection. Christ the first fruits, and then we at his coming. He says it more than once. More than once, he says, at his coming. When he shall have put down all authority. Well, that doesn't happen in a pre trip scenario. It, it, the bad stuff's just getting started. Paul, in the rapture passage, says when the resurrection takes place, the rapture, then, there's that word, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy victory? O oh, grave, where is thy sting? Or, by, uh, or the other way. Um, death shall be swallowed up in the, So you have death. The last enemy, Paul says, will be destroyed. When? At, at, at the rapture. Okay. So, putting our investigation hat on, we look at that, okay. If we put the rapture before the tribulation, and we read the book of Revelation about the tribulation, would that fit? Well, we see in one place a third, a fourth of the world's population will be destroyed, and then a third after that, a third more of the world's population will be destroyed. The, the uh, fourth horseman of the apocalypse is what horse? The gray? What's he called? Death. So if we had the resurrection before those horses and before a third of the world population is slaughtered and before the fourth of the world's population is slaughtered, if we have a resurrection before that, which Paul says, then shall be brought to pass. Death is, is over. Would that fit? With the tribulation to follow, when tribulation is going to be massive, massive death. It's, a, it's death's greatest period of history. It's death. It, it looks like death is the victor. So it doesn't fit. So, uh, I don't care what Mary says, she's wrong. It just can't be. If when the resurrection takes place, death is defeated, it can't be before the tribulation because tribulation is death's finest, finest hour. But if you put it at the end, when Jesus comes back in Armageddon and he wraps up that period and he starts the thousand-year reign, it fits. Last trump fits, first resurrection fits. What Jesus said, you can learn from it. Book of Revelation, just like another New Testament book, you can swallow it and eat it and consume it and practice it. It all fits. Nice and tidy. Bill is guilty. He killed his wife. You don't listen to Mary. I mean, you do. Bless her heart. She's sincere. And she's giving you her opinion. But the investigators, the judge and the jury will not put credence in what Mary says. Not if it violates the forensics. Now, if Mary's in the testimony, she says, yeah, you know, I, I was looking out my window like I always do, looking to see what the neighbors are doing. I was looking out my window, and, and you know, I saw Bill slap her in the driveway. He slapped her yesterday. So, well, that's... That doesn't prove anything, but it, it, it's, in, it's more interesting and pertinent. You, you mean you saw Bill Slaver? Yeah, he was mad. He was yelling at her. 
Well, then the next day, Sue ends up dead, and Bill's got her blood, and he runs off, and nobody can help me. So what Mary says is compatible. Not the proof, but it's compatible. It's interesting. Oh, but do you know what he was mad about? You know, so we, we, maybe we can find the motive. We could and learn something. But if Mary says, I heard one gunshot. And the medical examiner comes in and there's two bullet holes in her head. She said, no, no, I just heard one, one gunshot. What's the, judge, where, the investigator, the judge, the, where, which one are they going to side with? She was shot twice, but I only heard, it doesn't matter. Wait, you know, it doesn't matter. So you, you have different degrees of weighted information, and the forensics, number one, number one. So the question, we always go back with any other doctrine, which we all agree, hypothetically, we all agree that the scriptures are the basis. And so that's why the pre-tribbers will <coughs> hold up a similar Bible as mine, maybe the same one. The Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that God would not allow his people to go through tribulation. We're, we've not been called to wrath. Jesus said he would come get us, and that there's mansions. And, and so they have some scripture, and they point to the Bible and say, the Bible teaches pre-trib any time eminence, resurrection. That's what I was taught, and that's what I used to teach. But Bible study, in the same manner that you would study any other doctrine, will cause a person to throw all that out and say, that's not true. It's just not true. Not that part. It's just not true. You, you have to compromise too much um, and throw away the book of Revelation, basically, in the words of Christ. I, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. It's just, I couldn't do that with any other doctrine. And um, so it all goes back to how we approach our study of... You know, we're not studying the whole book, but gleanings from Revelation where we look at, okay, let's look at seals, trumpets, and vials. If, if I believed in imminence and there are no signs, and I believed that I'm not going, nor will my children or my grandchildren have to go through hard times, if I believe that, then I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't approach the book the way I do. But I'm scared not. I'm afraid not to read and receive the Word of God in Revelation and in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. And I promise you that if you read those and let it just say what it says you'll realize that we are in the last days. And we all agree on that. We're, we're living in the last days. But if you're thinking that the whole church universal is going to escape and we're going to get a resurrection before Jesus comes back, that, to me, is false hope. It's false doctrine. It's just not true. And the rest of it, I love Hal Lindsey. Oh, well, he's got great insight about what's going to happen. But the thing about it that he he doesn't believe, he understands, and he he's interested in it, and he teaches it, and he writes about it. But then, by the end of the book, he said, "But if you're saved, you can escape all that." And so they use it as an evangel evangelistic tool to get people saved. Because if you're saved, and you know Christ, you won't you won't have to worry about it. Well, then why should I even have to study it? I've, it's not, you know. It'd be like me studying the laws of cleansing the temple and the ashes of the red hair. For, I don't, I, I know that. I'm, I'm out of that. So I don't study it. I don't hang on every word about the ashes of the wet, red heifer. Well, okay, well, you know why? Or the law? Or what? Because that's, it, I'm not 
there. And the same idea is taught about the tribulation, about the book of Revelation. <clears throat> so, I encourage you not to take my word about any of this, but accept this. Accept this. Study and read this book that promises you a blessing if you'll read it, if you'll hear it, and if you'll keep it. That advice or that mandate is contradictory to a major teaching that the church is getting today and has for the last few decades. And it, it brings about a, a blessing when, when you, you take it simply for what it says. Okay, any questions or comments? Um, Very good. Absolutely. That's, that's in the very, very back of, of yeah. the last chapter. Exactly. Uh, somebody said, I believe that even Bill can be saved if he will repent and ask Jesus into his heart. Absolutely. Anybody else? You know, It's, yeah, uh, it's it relates to the idea of suffering. Yeah. Well, he would have raptured the Lamb's family too, right? Right. We don't we don't have a situation where, or there's not a precedence for God arbitrarily destroying a people without giving them signs, preliminaries, a buildup, and. Um, the idea that God is going to sneak up on his church without any warning, without any signs, like a thief in the night, is it, it contradicts Matthew 25 in the parable of the virgins, <clears throat> which is in the same context of 24. And the parable of the ten virgins shows that when the bridegroom comes... The watchman says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. So the virgins, the wise virgins that have oil in their lamps, they leave the house, just like the rapture passage says. We shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So sure enough, in the parable of the marriage, the, the, the word goes out, the sign, because it's nighttime. And so the watchman is looking, and he sees the lamps. He sees the torches. So he knows, because it's been announced, there's going to be a wedding. So the virgins are asleep. So he wakes them up and said, the bridegroom's coming. Let's go out to meet him. And that was the custom in that day, is that when the bridegroom would come for the bride, there would be an entourage with the bridegroom, but there would also be a, a family and friends that were with the bride to go out and escort him in. And sure enough, in Matthew 25, the typical Jewish uh, marriage custom of that day does not fit what is being taught with this pre-trip. The bridegroom comes. There he is. Let's go. They go out to meet him. They make a U-turn. Come back to the house. The pre-trib has it. The bridegroom comes. The virgins go out to meet him. And then the bridegroom makes a U-turn and goes back to heaven. So the virgins leave the house and go to the bridegroom's house up in heaven with the rapture scenario. And Jesus taught specifically, and the, the, the context is the second coming of Christ, that we go out to meet him, we make the U-turn, not Jesus, and come back. And it says, go into the house and shut the door. Well, the five foolish virgins can't come in because they missed it, and the door's shut. <clears throat> that, what Jesus taught, fits Revelation. It fits Paul. It fits Daniel. And that's what Jesus said. 
And to dismiss that and say, no, when Jesus comes, he's not coming to the earth. He's just coming in the clouds. We'll be caught up together with him, and then we'll go to heaven for seven years while all the tribulation is taking place in the earth. The Bible does not teach that anywhere. It's, it's, it's not in the Bible. And no, in my opinion, nobody ever came up with that by reading the Bible. You had to read a commentary. You had to get it from somebody else. And you trust the person who tells you this is what the Bible says because they're right on maybe everything else. You love them. You trust them. Good teacher, good preacher, good pastor, whatever. You, you have, they have credibility. So they say it, it's in the Bible. Okay, it must be in there. When I was a young man, I came to the place where I was pressed to prove with the scriptures what I was saying. And I thought, well, the Bible teaches it. Because I, I know I was taught right. But I couldn't find it. And it bothered me. And I kept thinking, well, I'm stupid. That's the problem. I'm stupid. These smart people are a lot smarter than me. They're smarter than me. They've got degrees. They're teachers. They're writers. They're smarter than me. They say it's in there. It, so I was pulling my hair out, and I'm just, and I couldn't prove, or so I couldn't have evidence for this mystery of a pre-trib secret catching away and being gone for seven years while the tribula. I couldn't find it. Couldn't. Couldn't. I just couldn't. And finally, I got so frustrated. I say, God, what's wrong with me that I'm so dull? I can't. See, I don't see it. And it was like the Lord spoke to me and says, "Start over. Just start over. Pretend you know nothing, and just let my word speak." But I had to be willing to. Oh boy, that was tough. I had to be willing to break ranks, and and that was hard. Um, and to be you know, rejected and, and thought to be stupid, which I thought I was stupid. But then I realized I'm not stupid. It's just not there. They were wrong, and that's fine because I'm talking about family and friends and church and people I love, but they were wrong. They were just wrong, mistaken. It's not, that, you know, maybe their fault or maybe don't accuse them of anything, but as a preacher, I had to be able to, pr to prove it before I say, I can't say it's in the Bible and then I can't, I can't back it up. I just can't do it. And then when I started over, I said, I'm just going to start over. I'm just going to read it. And I'm going to write it down. And that's before I had a smartphone and the Bible app. So it was a longer process. Easy now. But, so I started writing it down, writing it down. And I, and I made a covenant. I'm going to believe what I write down. And I'm going to only write down what it says. And I came up with a conclusion over a period of two or three years, maybe. It was a process. Come to the conclusion that there's just one second coming. And it's when Jesus said it was. And it's when the prophets said it was. When Revelation said it was. And that's after the tribulation. And the resurrection is, wh is when the Bible says it is over and over and over. Jesus said, I will raise them up in the last day. Last day. Not seven years before the last day. At the last, and he says it four times. So it, made, it started making sense, and I got excited. I thought, well, this, this all fits. First resurrection means first. And I don't have to... Say, well, it, you know, no, no it, it, it says first, but there, there was one before it, before the tribulation. And that's when we're going to go home, go to heaven. We won't have to face the Antichrist. And it always bothered me to have to explain why first didn't mean first. Or last didn't mean last. Oh, it's last trumpet. Yeah, that's the rapture, yeah. But pastor, and one guy said that, pastor, uh, in Revelation there's seven trumpets. And this was a guy that was just a new Christian. Boy, he had me. I, I finally said, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't twist this anymore. I can't twist this no more. <laughs> I quit. I just quit, and it started over. And when I started over, it was so much more simple. It, you know, it just. And then Revelation is now with this new new understanding. Revelation is really important. 
and then I began to read that and study that because I can't dismiss it anymore. I can't because I, you know, I've seen the light. So anyway, as we we'll close for tonight, but as we go through these seals, trumpets, and vials, it pertains to the world for sure, but it's directed by heaven, and the information about that is given to the churches. The wrath is not directed towards us, but the information about the wrath is directed to us. So I'm not saying we come under the wrath of God, which that they kind of accuse us of believing that. No, 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 no. I agree with them that we're not called to wrath, and uh, we're not the recipients of his wrath, but we are the recipients of the, of the, of the persecution by the devil and by the Antichrist. We are, and, and that's always been the case. So uh, it's a wonderful thing, uh, I think, to keep it simple and say the whole, the whole Bible's for us. It's for us. It's for us. So let's just read it. Let's whatever it says. We just believe it. There'll be things that are complicated, and maybe we don't know. There's some things I'm not. I'm not quite sure. And I'll talk to you about some of some of the things. I you know I don't know. It's it's kind of a a mystery to me still. But not on when the resurrection is going to take place because uh, through the multitude of witnesses this has been established and they're in agreement all the evidences of the murder agree Bill did it don't matter what the neighbors say okay let's pray Father we love you and we thank you for our time together we thank you for your word we thank you for the simplicity of your word we thank you for the authority of your word and we ask you lord to bless your people tonight be with them give them a good night's rest we pray for those who are sick and for those who are afflicted uh, we pray for our brother jack lord right now who's having pain uh, and is not feeling well we pray that you would touch him right now and others that have uh, virus or colds or sickness uh, we pray for them for a quick healing in the name of Jesus. For those who are in tribulation or trials or difficulties, we pray that you sustain them and that you minister to them. And may we all, Father, love your word. May we love revelation. And may we receive the blessing. You said we'd be blessed if we would read it, hear it, and keep it. And that's what we're doing. And so we, by faith, in the name of Jesus, we receive the blessing of the book of Revelation. And we claim that. And I claim it for all of those that are here and all of those who are watching on live stream that the blessing that you promised, if we would study this book, I pray and believe and we agree that this, this blessing would come upon your people because we embrace it and we do not reject it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory to God. Bless you. All of you live streamers, God bless you. Appreciate you so much.